everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about You will bring about Oh, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks. We're going to have a fantastic conversation about a couple of authors talking about their new book, Alzheimer's, The Uncertain Journey. And this book is fabulous, uh, loaded with great information, and I know you're going to enjoy the show. But before I introduce you to our guests, I always like to do a couple of shout outs. One, of course, is to have you visit alzheimerspeaks.com. There we have a whole section of free educational resources that you can participate in from being a guest on the show to if you're living with dementia, participating in our Dementia in the Arts or our Dementia Chats, submitting poetry, um, downloading tools, uh, reading our blogs, and, and so, so much more. I also want to direct you to Dementia Map, which is our sister company, which is a resource directory that has over 150 categories that you can search. And maybe you listening have a service product or tool. We'd love you to be part of the directory. So just reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. And then of course, I'd be amiss if I didn't mention Twiddle. Uh, Twiddle has um, these wonderful sensory aids that really help stimulate people and help control anxiety and bring a calmness to them. They also have a garment uh, that they designed called adapt wrap It's wonderful for people who have limited mobility. Last, I want to give a shout out to Rock Mahomes. Uh, we just celebrated their 40th anniversary of holistic care. They are just an absolutely brilliant company. They have three uh, small group home styles that are just absolutely fantastic. And I want to thank also Twiddle, for donating some products as giveaways, as well as Senny, which uh, donated products as giveaways dealing with incontinence. And they, they're they just amazing in and of themselves um, in terms of their absorbency and the length of time somebody can stay dry. So it just increases independence and so much more. I'm just barely touching on things. And last, I want to give a shout out to Artifacts. They are launching a new study soon. And um, if you are interested in learning more about them, you can email them at brainhealth at artifacts. And artifacts only has the one A in the beginning, dot com. Brainhealth at artifacts dot com. So with that, I am going to introduce you to our guests. Well, Guy and Renee, I am so excited to have you two on the show today. I've read your book and I am just amazed at the work and the wealth of information that is in it. So let's, I, I just can't wait to get started. So first of all, thank you for taking time uh, to be with us today. Everyone's kind of around the world here. So our time zones and stuff, uh, we had to coordinate, but um I'm going to have you each start out by introducing yourself. So, um, Guy, if you don't mind introducing yourself first to our audience. Yeah, my name is Guy Slovak. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, recently retired. I've been very, very interested in patient education for some 30 years now. And I was involved with the development of uh, one of the first, or probably the first um, major information source of health information on the internet in the late 1990s, which was, when I developed it, I wasn't sure how to use it. I approached it at um, AOL, and I approached Yahoo, which were the two major players at the time, and I said, would you have any use for this? And Yahoo came back within a day and said, 
please, we'd love to use it. And actually, that was the start of Yahoo Health, which for about 10 to 12 years was the dominant health player online uh, with almost all views. Uh, WebMD came a bit later, but Yahoo Health was the dominant. Uh, our information played a major role for the first few years, and then they collected information from other sources and ultimately we moved the information to our own site and updated it and then ran it as your medical source um so i've always been involved in patient education and dementia care well i'll I'll respond to that if i'm asked later how i ever got to getting involved with dementia okay sounds good um renee do you want to introduce yourself please Sure. I'm Renee Dupre, and I have been a freelance journalist, writer, and um, public health worker for many, many years. I've worked with Guy on um, Your Medical Source um, since the early 2000s, and um, I sometimes say I'm an English professor who stopped at the public health department one day and never left. So um, so I, I work at multiple different places, but um, primarily my role is that I am a writer, first and foremost, and um, I just am really blessed and gifted to be able to work in with Guy on getting health information out to the world. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Guy, funny, you mentioned about uh, telling your story of how you got connected with dementia. That's one of the things I always do is ask all my guests is, you know, have they been touched personally in family or circle of friends uh, by dementia? Actually, uh, the answer to that is negative other than Knowing some, uh, say, friends who, family who have been affected, but my close family, fortunately not. However, um, in collecting all this information back in the 1960s and how I actually got involved, you may remember El Gore from back then in the late 1990s, he made the speech about the internet. And about the day after that speech, I wrote to him. And and this was like, I felt this new internet, whatever it may be, was going to be probably the crucible of uh, information for the world in the years to come. And that propelled me to try and get a, a source of information, health information together that would be unlike anything other that's been done before. And to achieve this... I identified world leaders in uh, various disciplines, be it uh, uh, high blood pressure, asthma, um, and Alzheimer's was one of the hundreds of disciplines. And then I identified the key leaders and wrote to them and invited them to submit manuscripts, and then we would rewrite those. And so one of the manuscripts that came in, uh, head and shoulders above all others, was the one on Alzheimer's. But it wasn't about Alzheimer's, which is what it was supposed to be, what is Alzheimer's, etc. It was more about caring for people with Alzheimer's. And when I read this manuscript, I was a young doctor, newly qualified, and I was so touched by this because to me it wasn't just about people with Alzheimer's and dementia, it was about older people in general. And truly, it, it affected the way I view all the people, I was young at the time, and and it 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 affected me in such a way that to to me an older person at the time was a patient. He's just another old pay, older patient. But suddenly you could see after reading this a whole life story behind each and every person. And my attitude, the way I practice medicine, became so affected by this. The long and short of this, I felt. This could not simply go up online as another article. I'm going to hold this back, and one day we're going to turn this into a book. But unfortunately, too many years passed, but I had met Renee in the interim, and I knew it could only be Renee that could help me achieve this. But we had so many other articles to work on to develop for Yahoo. So ultimately, we got to this, and 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 at last we've managed to publish it. But that's the story, maybe not in short, but that's what it is. Okay, great. Well, how interesting it's, you know, it gets back to that core of, for each of us, you know, a lot of times we don't think we have that big of effect 
in the world or on individuals. And it just shows how, you know, that manuscript affected you greatly. And then you sharing it with Renee and then, you know, what has, a, what has evolved in terms of if your work in general and, you know, expanding that to, um, again, your book and how that's going to impact so many people, that ripple effect in terms uh, of, again, how we all are gifted in our own little ways. And we, we don't always understand the power of one that each of us, each of us holds. Renee, how about you? Were you personally touched by dementia in your own family or circle of friends? Um, yes. Um, I've been actually very deeply affected even since childhood. Um, I, my grandfather, who was a tall, powerful, former lumberjack and Irishman, um, was struck one day with Parkinson's, he, um, and he developed um, Lewy body dementia. And so I remember vividly from my childhood, the, um, my father fighting to get him into the shower, and you know, really just knowing that this wasn't right. It felt like this isn't how we should be caring for someone who we respect so much, but there were no other alternatives. And it was back in the days when if someone developed dementia, they were referred to as senile. Remember that, that word? And then my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, it was my maternal grandfather, and my maternal grandmother um, likewise developed dementia toward the end of her life. And watching my mother try to care for her with much more compassion. It was a few years later, we understood more, but still, um, you know, a tragic story that because she couldn't communicate, um, she loved beets. And one day my mother brought her beets to eat. And the next day, the nursing uh, facility, somebody noticed some red in her stool and thought she was bleeding. And um, because there was no way to communicate with her, um, they brought her into the hospital and pumped her stomach, and she ended up hiccuping herself to death after the. So it was tragic, and so those two things have really stuck with me. And then, as we'll talk about later, my own father um, just passed this year after a very long struggle with dementia. So it's been very personal to me. Um, it remains personal, and um, is something that this book was just the opportunity to work on this book was such a gift because of that. You know, it is interesting again, how these moments in time can kind of change the trajectory of our lives and what's important and, and our missions. I had a friend who um, said to me one time, she's like, how did you get into this space? And I said, well, you know, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years. And she said, no, how did you really get into the space? And, and she said, I want you to go back and look at your life in five-year increments and write down who was important or what happened during those five years. And when I did that, even before my mom had dementia, I would have landed here. I mean, it's just, it's kind of incredible, but you know, I never looked at that in that, in that fashion. So I always like to mention that because I think sometimes people feel lost or without purpose. And that might be a way to get on track or to understand even how you really landed in the space that you're now working in. And it's usually passion driven, but it's embedded in us over time in terms of, of our, our life experiences. That's my belief anyways, with that. So thank you too, for, for sharing that guy. I want you to talk about your, your new book here, Alzheimer's, the uncertain journey, navigating the challenges, you know, which is just really an indispensable guide for caregivers and families to, to come together. What was the impotence of, of, I guess, writing the book, you know? Well, this manuscript that I referred to was only 30 pages. The book today is some 400 pages. The manuscript is maybe one chapter of the book, but it's the heart. It's the core of the book. And after I'd read this, uh, this manuscript, I, I felt the absolute need to share it. And I, 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 I think I coined this phrase, and I use it in the book, um, 
when I introduced that chapter, the language of caring, which is the, the terminology that Bernard Isaacs used, and of course, validation, uh, which is an only field's term. But I, I sort of coined a term that would bring it all together, which was bridging your worlds. And the, the concept here was to, to get a book out there that would connect the person suffering the disease with the person caring for them. And Bridging Your Worlds, I didn't feel was an appropriate title for the book because it, you need to understand the meaning. And I, I, I felt the, the title should be explicit in you know what you're trying to say, nothing deep. So my, my aim in getting this book out there was, though I've not been touched by the disease, I've been touched by the manuscript in understanding what people are going through who who have suffered who, and who are caring for these kind of people. And and so um, I just, and I knew on my own I couldn't do it because I didn't have that background that was necessary. And, um, and, and that's why, I, well, we, I was already working with Renee and Renee had this history and, as she said to me at the time, this is an absolute gift. And and so it, it, it was, it, it seemed all to fit together. Uh, and, and we both worked in this. We both wrote various chapters for, for the book around uh, Professor Isaac's uh, chapter. And I think uh, that, and it took a number of years. This was not a quick thing because we were both busy with our own lives. But ultimately we got there. Wow. Well, I'm glad you did, um, for sure. It is it is interesting. And I think, you know, that approach of what it is versus how do you live with it graciously? You know, they're, they're two totally different pieces. And you need both of them to live well with it for the person with dementia and, and those that are caring if it's a if it's a family member or, you know, a professional, I think everyone needs those insights where tasks are heartfelt you know and that the heart leads in terms of how we carry out those tasks um you know in the world we live in today you know we commonly hear the word um person-centered care which jives me through the roof because i think it's overused and under delivered and i don't think people understand what it really means and in a world of micromanagement i think your book kind of breaks through everything just being a task, but you're giving the reason of why this needs to be done, why these approaches are needed and how they can be helpful and, and who they help, you know, because anytime we help somebody dementia or not, I'm a firm believer. It's a ripple effect. You know, it, it affects everyone. You change one and you change everything and it can be slow or it can be, you know, a tsunami wave, depending on, on the size of, of that change. So um, thank you for that. Um, Renee, anything you want to add about how the book came together? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, first of all, you know, obviously Guy and I had been working on multiple different manuscripts as he had um, so I think the last one I'd worked on him was constipation. <laughs> I mean, that's how broad though your medical. Um, and then one day he pulled this book out or this manuscript by Isaacs out, and I too was just deeply, deeply touched by it. Um, and you know, partly on the basis of my own experiences. And then I unfortunately got called home um, because my mother had been diagnosed with advanced colon cancer. And while I was there, I realized dad wasn't acting right. Um, and we'd had some of the, what I would later find out, the first classic signs of, you know, not managing money well for somebody who'd been a very, very successful businessman. Um, and as we were there, I said, you know, we need to do something. So it was literally about two weeks later after receiving this manuscript from Guy that my own father was diagnosed with dementia. And um, so it was a gift to be able to work on this book with its approach and with, with Lone's apps, or I'm sorry, Bernard Isaac's um, absolutely amazing approach 
and generosity and um, thoughtfulness. And that was what I really worked hard in all of my work with this is I'm going to update the science. I'm going to update the tools um, that he couldn't even have imagined because he did pass in 1996. Um, but I am not going to change the core tone of this book. So I went and I read several of his books um, just so that I could, um, in all of my work, try to keep and preserve that that tenderness and gentleness and the wit that um, he always um, had in all of his writings. So that was really a task. Well, I like that you mentioned the, the tenderness and the wit, um, because a lot of times I think, you know, well, I personally believe, you know, we have been programmed to think that this is overly difficult and that we're not capable of caring for somebody with dementia for years and years and years. That's kind of what we've been told. Um, we're not enough. And yet it comes down to having empathy and compassion, which hopefully we weave in all of our lives. And dementia is just another thing we have to adapt to. And then when you mentioned, you know, the humor, I also think when people are struck with a, um, a chronic illness or anything major in their life, we, we kind of push humor out the window and we're like, this is serious. We have to take this serious and, and we can't laugh. And, you know, there's things that need to be done. And yet, uh, you know, with, with my, my dad had um, brain cancer. My mom had dementia for 30 years humor was the glue that kept us together because it's just such a natural part of our relationships. And again, it's one of those things that really isn't talked about. You know, people, people go, well, you can't laugh at them. I'm like, I'm not laughing at them. I'm laughing with them. You know, some of these things are pretty darn funny. And those are the things that I, for me, my mom's been gone 10 years now. Those are the things I love remembering, uh, remembering us laughing together at goofy little things that happened in our lives, you know, and again, it wasn't laughing at one another, it was laughing together. And um, just recognizing that that's an important piece of our relationship that I, I think keeps us bonded, keeps us grounded and keeps us balanced. And when we take things too seriously or we make them too complicated, you know, our stress levels as a care partner go up and then that is projected and, and um, absorbed by the person we're caring for. And then it's, you know, kind of mirrored back at us. And then we point our finger going, well, they're agitated. And they're like, they were fine <laughs> before we walked in the door, you know, and getting us to understand our, our multi-sensory connections and the importance of, of slowing down just to pay attention to one another um, because not all of our needs are projected in words. And, and I think um, I have seen, and I have heard repeatedly from people that, you know, when a disease comes, they just want someone to tell them what's wrong. How do I fix this? What do I do? And they don't know, you know, they're in the dark, just like anyone else. This is all new to them as well. And so we have to, uh, you know, make this a, a family project, a we project, not a, not a I versus them type thing. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for us, you know, and again, putting that core of the relationship back and, and, it, you know, it sounds like, you know, with Isaac, he he really understood all that bernard isaac really understood the importance of relationship and and empathy and and something that's actually implementable that doesn't scare people away and uh so often i still hear things that you know families say it's just too complicated i can't do it you know i i, I don't have the time i don't have the energy i don't I don't have the, the, the smarts to even process all of these things or the finances to, to implement things. And that's part of what I love about your book is it really lays things out in multiple ways to be able to approach on a very humanistic level um, that I think takes the scary out of things. Um, and, and scary and loneliness are probably two of the biggest things that we hear about Renee, I, well, I want to ask you, you know, there's so many books that uh, and articles that have been written about caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. 
How would you say your book is different? Well, I think you've been touching on it, and um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of um, really trying to stay true to Dr. Isaac's approach. He was, he's still known as the, one of the fathers of geriatrics. Um, and so it was just such an honor to work on that. And it is that, that humor that this is something that we can, you can do. And we tried to make it comprehensive without making it overwhelming. Um, and to allow the information to come in the bites just so that people could meet and find the information they needed when they need it, because it can Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis can be so overwhelming for people um, that sometimes they can't absorb all the information at once. And so, by chunking it out into these tiny little pieces, by preserving um, Isaac's tone and his deep compassion for us all, us all as we age. I'm not going to say the elderly, you know, if we're lucky enough, we will all age. Um, and um, so I think that to me was one of the most um, significant parts of the book. And, you know, we worked really hard to also assure that the science is accurate, it's up to date, and um, that it is understandable. And so those are a couple of things we worked very hard because the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's is still not fully understood or other dementias. We understand more about some and less about some. Um, but um, we wanted to be sure that when we wrote about it, it was in a way that anybody could understand. So our commitment to what is now called health literacy um, in the book, I think, is also unique. Well, and, and I love that, and I appreciate that so much, because I do think that people think, oh my gosh, 400 pages, A, am I going to be able to get through it? And everyone thinks they have to memorize it, and most of us don't have a photographic memory, so that's not going to happen, <laughs> you know. Um, but it's easy to be able to go back in the book and review and know that, you know, it is a resource. Um it, you know, a lot of caregivers, when they find a book that really meets their needs, um, they use the phrase, this is my, this is my Alzheimer's or dementia Bible. Uh, this one, I won't borrow out. I will tell people go buy your own, <laughs> you know, or, or I'll gift them one. But I, I want this as a resource because they find such great um, information and wealth of knowledge. And I think even more so comfort. Oh, and when we're comfortable, I think we can care better, you know, when that stress is removed, when we're not just, you know, running around, like feeling like a crazy person, like there's not enough time in the day to do what I have to do. Um, but when you, when you find something that really feels, you know, kind of like a security blanket, um, you don't want to let go of it. And I think that's really what you've developed in your book um, for many, many people with that. Guy, would you like to add? Yes, I would. Interestingly, just a couple of days ago, we got a review back from the St. John's Dementia Resource Center. And I think they're quite an eminent organization. And they wrote, which I think answers your question too. One cannot think of a topic important to caregivers that is not covered in some way within the pages of this book. Carry this book with you. I, I'm not pushing the book. I'm just wishing to... To, to pass on what this reviewer wrote. Carry this book with you. Mark the pages of importance and jot down notes in the margins. This book is going to be an important tool in your dementia caregiving toolbox, which can help you through many days of uncertainty. With this news book in your library, you will be equipped with information, ideas, experience-based advice, and background to be your loved one's best dementia advocate. And I, I was thrilled with that because it, 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 it really says what we wish it would do. Yeah, and I, and I think it will for many, many people. Um, I can't wait to bring this to, I always bring books to my support groups, you know, and, and um, people take them and they bring them back and, you know, they talk about kind of their review and what they got out of it and goes on to the next, next person and stuff. And um, it's just uh, any way we can spread and give people comfort uh, I, I think is so, so critically important. Now, Guy, you know, when you started to write the book, 
did you have a particular audience in mind? And did, did that shift kind of your vision for the book? Did it shift as you wrote well, it? Well, honestly, the, 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 the intention was uh, to aim this at those caring for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And I think, if anything, the focus changed more toward Alzheimer. Uh, it, of course, it covers dementia, but we, we felt that nuanced approach may be appropriate. We talk about all the various type of dementias in the context as well, and we make we make it known at the outset that not every confused person has dementia or Alzheimer's. That's something that we feel critically important to understand. But really, I think maybe the view was one day we would do a second book on dementia as well. But initially, I think it, 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 when, I'd, when I'd written to Bernard Isaacs, the, the, the topic was really Alzheimer's and not dementia in general. And so I, I think um, while initially we wanted to broaden it out from just Alzheimer's, we did do that, but maintained the focus more on Alzheimer's. So there was some change, but really we, 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 we've kept uh, our focus uh, throughout the writing of this book on those who need it to care for their loved ones with a condition. Okay. Great. Um, Renee, anything you want to add to that as far as um, your target audience and, and kind of vision for the book? Well, um, I've always seen the book as um, not only for people who are personally family caregivers, but also for people who might be working in a care setting. Um, so CNAs, MAs, those who might be working in um, homes. And we have had, um, I had one person who is a um a dear friend who's a psychiatrist working in a um care home and he went and he bought a copy of the book for all of his staff and they had discussions so i see it as a real educational tool for people who are professionals or paraprofessionals as well as family caregivers um and the and this i think one of the things that this book is unique about is it can span across different audiences. I know people who have been early in their Alzheimer's diagnosis, who um, actually their partner was reading the book and they asked to read it as well because they wanted to know what to expect, what was going to come. And they were able at that point to have conversations with their care partners um, to help them enlist in making their own decisions and making clear what their needs were as they knew that they were going to be able to lose the ability to communicate that. And so I think that um, the book is also for someone who has been recently diagnosed and it may actually be for all of us because none of us know that we are not going to develop some sort of dementia in our lives. It's There's no guarantee out there. And so I think it's a book that really anyone could read and use, especially as we're looking at um, planning for the future. Um, you know, we've we've talked about this before, but I'm the COVID mom. Uh, we have been working on COVID for five years and we know that there are um, unfortunately, many very young people who are developing dementia after having a bout with COVID. Um, so we're all at risk of this. So if we can have the information we need to let others know how, if we are on this uncertain journey, um, how we want to be cared for and what we want to do, I think it's good for all of us. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's wonderful for everyone. I would love to see this, you know, out to every single doctor, because I think it would change how they give a diagnosis just by having a resource for them um, to, to say, I, I think there's just a ton they would learn in here because so many of them don't know diddly squat about the disease and the process and the things that, that um, people can do. And, and that, that lack of knowledge, that lack of empathy, a lot of times can really affect a family walking out the door with this diagnosis. And so just being able to have a doctor who understands it a little bit more to understand that there are options, there are resources, there um, are different ways to care. Um, 
I think would make the doctor themselves feel like they're doing something because they know we don't have a cure. You know, I can't put you on this care plan that's going to make this all go away. And families are really looking, I mean, granted, everyone would love a, a cure, but families are really looking at what do I do now? Where do I go? And, and they're not getting any information, most of them. They're just being told, you know, come back in a year or six months, here's your prescription and get your affairs in order because your person's going to die. And, you know, that's a pretty depressing way to walk out a door where if, a, you know, a doctor had an understanding and could give hope and even refer them to a book like this or, um, you know, Dementia Map or the Alzheimer's Association or the Alzheimer's Society or the foundation. I mean, there's so many things out there that people don't know. And to me, part of us having an impact is we need to get this information to the doctors. So when that, when they first get diagnosed, it's, um, it's not as depressing. Again, a chronic illness is always going to be depressing. That's going to be a normal feeling. You're going to have anger. You're going to have grief. You're going to have all of those things, but you should be able to have hope and alternatives that you can customize into your own family and to your own culture and your own financial and um, personal beliefs of how we want to care for one another. And so, um, yeah, the person with dementia, especially in the early stages, um, I think this is going to give them hope and alternatives. A lot of people don't understand that in many situations, they are, when they get um, diagnosed early, they're on the ground running, looking for resources. They're kind of the main peeps out there because, you know, their, their family is still has to work. You know, there, there are other things going on. And I, I think probably 90% of the population doesn't understand what, um, what a person with dementia offers in terms of finding alternative treatments you know, because they have, and they'll be the first to say, I've got the time and I'm making connections, you know, through my support groups that they find and, and it just keeps growing. So I think the book will help them. I think it'll help families enormously, but I think it will help take the burden off the physicians in terms of not feeling so guilty. And that's what we hear by, you know, from so, so many of them with that. If you are just tuning in right now, we have been talking with Renee and Guy, who are the authors of Alzheimer's, The Uncertain Journey, Navigating the Challenges, and uh, just an absolutely fantastic book. Uh, you can go to their website, which is yourmedicalsource.com forward slash Alzheimer's. You can find them on Twitter as Beat Alzheimer's and they are on Facebook as Your Medical Source. And again, just an incredible, incredible um, book. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more, but I always like to give a little plug for Q for Good. I don't know if anyone out there is looking for a wonderful webmaster. These guys are really socially conscious too. Um, but I personally work with them. And when I hear something that I really believe in, I like to share that with people. Um, they they kind of like Guy and Renee have made it easy to understand the process like they've done with their book. Q for Good has done that with the websites to be able to talk at whatever level you're at to communicate in writing, to give you that calmness, that insight to avoid issues or correct issues as they pop up, as things twist and turn. And um, I, I just can't say enough good things about them. If you mention, you know, my name or Alzheimer's Speaks, you can also get 10% off, which of course I'm thrilled to be able to pass that on to you. But you can just go to Q for Good. And, dot com and again just just absolutely incredible to to deal with so um with that little plug let's go back to guy and renee and guy i'm going to throw this one to you first um you know on your book you know it lists of course you and renee and it and it lists dr isaac but there's also a fourth person um listed as an author so 
Can you tell us a little bit? We've heard about Dr. Isaac. We've heard about you and Renee. Um, who is Candace and how did she, you know, come into the fold with the book? Candace was writing her own book. And I was part of a, a group of uh, authors who were planning to publish. And she saw what I was writing, said, I'd love to read that. And she read it and came back and came back with some great ideas to make the book more user-friendly than what she thought it was at the time. And we had a few personal stories in the book, but maybe not as many as we should have had. And there were also issues that she felt we we should incorporate in the book. Um, and so I invited her to to write a couple of chapters for us. And I, I told her, if we incorporate these chapters, we like them. Um, rather than just give you a, a, a title of contributor, we would make you part of the book because you're making you're help helping make the book friendlier um than it was before um we we never really had any negative criticism on this book but i i, I just thought that uh if we could make it even friendlier and warmer i think that was it warmer than it was and so um she sat down and wrote about four or five stories uh, in which she had been involved um stories because she her family had 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 alzheimer's and so she had stories to tell and she also worked in 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 that arena and so she'd had stories interacting with others and then i decided i'd go out to various other caregivers that i knew and ask them to add their stories but it was thanks to her that we then went ahead and added multiple stories, which I think changed the tone of the book um, in a big way. And we also incorporated a, a, a few new concepts of uh, in, in terms of family relations. Um, when you first get the diagnosis about the first family meeting and the second family meeting, and again, that was her contribution to the book. And I thought they were big contributions. And um, and so we, we, we made her an author as a result of that. She wasn't a main player in the contribution, in, in the making of this book, but she added something that made the book warmer and friendlier. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Renee, anything you want to add to that at all? No, I'll um, leave that to Guy because I really wasn't involved with Candace. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I wanted to, you know, ask you, Renee, you know, what it's like to, to write a book that, you know, is, is a topic that you're living, you know, with, with your dad having Alzheimer's disease. How did that, um, how did that affect you and, and even your family? I know sometimes families get touchy about uh, people writing books. <laughs> about- <laughs> Uh, so and luckily it's I mean it, it wasn't a totally autobiographical I do have a little autobiographical pre- preface mm-hmm. and um, we'll be updating some of that as the journey went on but mostly it was um it truly was a gift to have the manuscript to work on um to live through this and see and to be able to understand and as long as I was careful <laughs> I could sometimes shape my um, siblings um, approaches to my dad of I just had to not come off as the know-it-all big sister you know it's, that's a sort of important um, but I think it really did impact my dad's care to be able to work with this book reading through it and just starting from that very core of Isaac's approach of respect and um, generosity and caring and the language of caring that we um, had been using um, so I shared um, bits of it often as I was going through this with my siblings and then as things progress with my father with his caregivers um, he was lucky enough to be able to have full-time care in his home 24 7 um, for the last several years of his life and so we had um, caregivers who were really deep 
built deep relationships with him. And um, I learned from them, and some of what I learned from them showed up in the book. And some of what we learned from the book um, showed up in um, in his caring. Um, at one point, um, I bought him, as we talk about in the book, the, the the sensory piece of having a stuffed animal or something. He loved dogs, but he was no able, no longer able to care for a dog by himself. And so we thought that was too much to ask a caregiver to actually take on dad and a dog. So I got him this big old life-size German Shepherd stuffed animal. And my sibling said, no. And they like disappeared. It was a Christmas gift and they disappeared it. They couldn't, yeah, because they couldn't handle that this was something that dad needed then. Um, and so they, and so that was, you know, a little source of tension, but just, you know, fast forward a couple of years later and we were back to, they were the ones buying things. So, so just having that available was, I think, really important. Um, and so it was this, you know, sort of mutually constituting learning experience. The sensory dog and, you know, bringing the comfort in that, People look at it like oh, that's childish. Can't do that. That's not dignified. And it's like, no, you're you're so missing the point on this. It's about comfort. You know, right. it's, it's about making the person comfortable. And uh, you know, for me, that was a big lesson because I was very task oriented when I stepped into this and do this, do that. I'm a I'm a planner. I, you know, I'm kind of a type A personality. I'm going to control the world type deal. And and, uh, you know, one day when I, I lost it with my mom, when she repeated herself, you know, like 45 times in 10 minutes, and I yelled at her horribly, and I felt, uh, I, I just, uh, it still stays with me that I, that I yelled at her the way I did, because I know better. And um, she, of course, forgot all about it, but I didn't. But it, it taught me that I had to approach caring differently and so, you know, I created a, a, a tool called your memory chip, which brings people down to, you know, what is most important. And for me, I kind of went back to Maslow's theory, you know, to baseline, you know, is she safe? Is she happy? Is she pain free? And that's what these, these sensory aids do is um, bring people into that comfort zone. And I think, you know, sometimes people look at Alzheimer's and dementia as this invisible disease that, well, they look okay. You know, they look okay. So they should, they should be able to deal with everything the way they used to. Well, no, you know, your book describes the, the failing brain and it, it talks about these sensory tools that are available. If it's a, if it's a big stuffed animal or if it's um, something like a twiddle product, um, that's like a, a muff that has little fidgets in it, or if it's a robotic dog or cat that they have nowadays. Um, I can't tell you how many families say, oh my gosh, my, my dad, you know, he has that cat on his lap and he's petting it all the time, you know, and it's just brings him comfort or when he doesn't have it, it's across the chair just so he can see the cat. So he's not alone. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand the importance of, of those things. I also loved when you talked about, you know, siblings can be on different pages and that can be a really difficult thing to maneuver. And uh, I ran across that with my own family, my, um, my brothers, uh, this was very late after my dad had died and my mom was in, in very late stages and we were talking about why they didn't come visit. And they said, well, you're a control freak. And I'm like, no, I'm not a control freak. I'm organized. That's why everybody comes to me. I'm organized. And that's how I saw myself. And we got into this in-depth conversation of perceptions. And I said, okay, I can, I, now that you're talking to me, I can see where you felt I was intimidating and I was controlling, but you could have told me that earlier. We could have had this conversation earlier um, and I'll take some of the responsibility, but I won't take it all. You know, it's not a blame game. It, it really is a, a, a chess game where you have to work together to maneuver, you know, your strategies um, with everything. And the only way we do that is, is through experience and having a comfortable conversation where people aren't threatened. And again, that's why I love your book. I think it just, it brings so many different, different levels out. Matt, can I just add something to that? Uh, I think 
Renee's a bit being a bit more humble. You know, she she has introduced concepts into important concepts into the book uh, based on her experiences with her dad. And I, I, she writes a beautiful story in the book about this one day she, she, she has come back from a swim in the lake and she finds the caregiver uh, being rather harsh with her father. Uh, he had been eating some ice cream before his dinner and the caregiver was maybe too strict, too strong with him. And she writes, after lambasting the caregiver, she writes, I asked the caregiver to imagine that man, my father, as a highly respected engineering professor lecturing to a room of graduate students, as a man negotiating a deal with a buyer from General Motors, as a man testifying in court as an expert witness about a ladder that failed or an airplane that fell out of the sky. And then when she saw that man, I told her then she could approach him about the ice cream before dinner or not, and that she needed to treat the man she could see in the same way she would treat the man she couldn't see, the one hidden inside, because that, it, that is who he still is in his own mind. And I thought that's very beautiful. And, and, and the, those kind of concepts that she's brought into this book from her own personal experiences, and I commend her hugely for that. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you what it was like working with someone who's actually experienced it. And you sum that up beautifully. And and Renee, I love that, you know, see the invisible man, because that's the core of who he is. You know, that never leaves. And and yet we live in a society where people judge us from the outside. And so it works against us in in many fashions. So when someone is early diagnosed, they look fine. There's nothing wrong with them. And then when their appearance maybe changes and their abilities change, then they want to, uh, you know, hold on uh, to what they see and then not and think that there's nothing more than that. But I, I can't tell you how many people, you know, told me to just walk away, you know, well, she doesn't remember you. So, you know, you don't need to go back. And, and what I found was there were two different camps. Um, one would ask, for example, how my mom was, and they really truly wanted to know, and they wanted to support me and my family in caring for her. And the other camp wanted to give permission for us to walk away because they couldn't emotionally deal with it. And so, you know, just, just leave it alone, Lori, so we don't have to have this conversation because because it makes me nervous. And uh, that shocked me. I, I wasn't expecting that. Did Renee, did you find that at all in your journey? Yes, definitely. I found people who were just like, well, okay, he's got Alzheimer's. Okay. We're just basically going to write him off, forget, you know, and, and then I found others who were still there and still, um, really, really genuinely interested in his care, in his well being. And, you know, none of his caregivers knew him before he had Alzheimer's. Um, and yet some of them developed these absolutely beautiful relationships with him in that moment. We had one caregiver who would, you know, we've got pictures of him dressing up in like little Hawaiian hula outfits and dancing around. My dad would never have done that. But you know what? In that moment, he had a blast and he loved it. And so there was real caring for who he was in the moment. And I think that was really, um, to me, those people who stayed stuck with us and um, you know, we just met not very long ago. And the other thing is, you know, even when it seems like people are not there or not cognizant, there can be these moments of connection. The last time I saw my dad, I went and bought a loaf of, I don't know if you remember, hillbilly bread with that little white packaging and the, and you know, so it's that, it's a soft bread, but it pretends to be kind of healthy because it's got a little bit of bulgur weed in it. Well, that was what his mother, my grandmother, would give us for dessert. That with some oleo, 
and um, or margarine and strawberry jam. That would be dessert because they were a poor farming family, and that was what she could afford for dessert. And so I said, I'm going to go buy some. So I got some, and I put some real butter on and um, gave him a piece. And we got there, and he picked up the loaf of bread, and he was like, I recognize this. This is after he had been. So those moments, I think, were gifts to him and to me of recognizing. And on the last time that I saw him alive, he knew it was the last time. He'd been hardly able to stand up. He had been hardly, um, there had been a couple of times when we, we'd actually called the hospice nurse wondering if he was beginning to transition. Um, and then we packed our bags and were heading out the door to catch the airplane. And suddenly he stood up on his own and gave my daughter and I a goodbye hug. Wow. And he knew who we were. Up until then, the only thing I could have said was, Dad, we're family. We're family. That that registered. I couldn't say who I was. Just say we're family. And that's all that mattered. But he knew who I was and he knew who my daughter was. And that was the gift, the final wow. gift he gave us. And there's so many of those when we step forward and are in the moment and allow those those things to happen. I'll never forget my mom. Um, she had been living in a nursing home uh, and, and she actually asked to move in because my dad was there um, because he he had um, taken a, a tumble down two flights of steps for whatever reason, didn't take the elevator and with his brain cancer, and he was never able to come home. And the plan was always for my mom to move in with us. And she she was with us a couple of weeks. And one morning she woke up and she said, I want to move to the nursing home. And of course, I was offended. Like, of course. Wrong? what do I, I need? I, I need to do better. You know, we talked about this. This was the plan. And she just looked at me. And this is a woman who could not look out the window and know if she should put on sandals or her snow boots. And she looked me directly in the eye and said, we've been married 49 and a half years and I'm Ooh. not abandoning him now. <laughs> and I said, I will make that happen. And so she ended up moving into the nursing home and, um, you know, towards the end of her journey, she, she all of a sudden started having these massive body seizures. I mean, they were they, they like, wouldn't stop. And, and, um, they had me come in to do her DNR paperwork all over again. Cause she had been there like 10 years and um, I'm sitting on the bed with the nurse and we're going over all the paperwork and my mom's in her big Jerry wheelchair and she's just, she's just sleeping. And the nurse leaves to make a copy. And, you know, um, and as many times as I had this conversation with my mom, I was still struggling. I was just struggling with, you know, she could die any day because of the way things were going. And, you know, we, she did not want to go to the hospital. She just, she didn't want any, you know, extra, extra care in the condition she was in. And um, I just, I'm going to get emotional. I said, mom, am I doing the right thing? And out of a dead sleep, she turned her head, she smiled at me and she went, yep. And then she went right back to sleep, but she knew in that I... moment what I needed and she gave it to me. And I will never forget the power of that moment. And it's there's a big so, deal. so many of those stories, you know, um, that are there, but we have to be, we have to be open to them and we have to never, ever forget that our relationships are much deeper than just you know, just our bodies. I mean, we are, we are connected at a soul level. I truly believe that I, I learned through my journey that there's different levels of unconditional love and the smaller that the relationships seem to be, the bigger they actually get and the deeper and more profound they are. And, um, you know, I just think it's one of, you know, caring for somebody with, with Alzheimer's or any type of chronic illness, you know, to step into that space and really become one with them, never losing your relationship is one of the biggest gifts you'll ever receive in your life. It's just a beauty. It's, it's, it, it's like a spiritual awakening. And anyways, it was for me. 
um, it's hard to even put into words. And Renee, did you feel that with your, your journey with your dad? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Um, and I wasn't his primary caregiver. My sister was. She did all of the coordination and all of that hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. And I would come in for as long as I could during the summers and, um, and you know, at other times whenever I was needed, if I could. Um, but I felt like it was such a privilege to be with him. Mm -hmm. and and there were times when we would laugh when he would see something on the television and decide well that was his wife or, or that was his daughter you know or it, where reality you know his um his reality tethers got kind of loosened up there he didn't have the reality tethers um but every moment every time there was just this the moments when we would have a flash uh, of knowing that he was still himself within himself he was still that man and that man who really cared deeply. And in some ways, this may sound almost odd, the dementia was a gift um, for us in another way because it, un it unleashed or allowed this sort of masculinity that my father had always had. You know, he was the son of a you know, poor farmer, very, you know, grew up in those, the era of the depression, um, post-World War II. He was, he was a tough guy, right? <laughs> Golden Gloves blocks, Golden Gloves boxing champion as a high schooler. And somehow when the dementia started, this gentle, caring part of him suddenly came out and we could see him in a completely different light. And in a way, because we'd always had a somewhat contentious relationship, my father and I, we were way too much alike. Um, it was an opportunity for us both to heal that and um, appreciate each other. And we stopped fighting. <laughs> I mean, so you can never say that there's not an opportunity to heal. Yeah. My mom was kind of very organized, kept the family together, kept the community together. I mean, she was just mm -hmm. in charge of this, that, and the other thing. And I, one of the things I learned from her was how important it is to play. I never really saw her play as an adult. And that side just blossomed. And it was like, mm -hmm. gosh, it was such a gift to be able to see this this joy at a at a like a child's level because I do think their joy is different than us as adults because our minds are going in so many different levels, and um to, to it, it was just it was so so incredible. The other thing I'll, I'll just mention, um, if you don't mind, is one other story again getting to that point of don't ever give up at the core of your relationship. Um, when my mom was um, towards the end of her journey, she started coming to me in dreams. And so one night she came and like, Lori, you got to finish that a bit. And I'm at two in the morning. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get up, <laughs> go to my typewriter and I start running. And she, you know, she, she seemed fine. You know, we weren't seeing any changes with her. She, she was doing well. And then all of a sudden she, she got really, um, sick and no one really knew why but she was just declining really quick and she had told me about three months earlier again in a dream that I would not be there when she died and I remember having this argument with her but I am that person mom that's what I do I help people transition of course I'll be there she's like no you will not be here I I need you not to be here one, I, she said, I need you, I need to know you're going to continue your work. And two, the rest of the family has to participate in death and dying. And she was always big in that. Even when we were really little kids, she would bring us to wakes and funerals and she would be scolded by her friends are way too young. They shouldn't be here. But that was just something that was really important to her. So when my mom is actively dying, I have two keynotes um, that I'm doing I think it was in Arizona at the time. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a one person show, so there's nobody I could hand it over to. So, and I knew that's where she wanted me to be. So I, I leave and I'm planning on just communicating with the family through the phone. 
And I, I, I get on the plane and I think my mom literally lined my whole trip up. Next to me on the plane is a man whose father-in-law just moved in with them who has dementia. So we talk the whole flight about what he's going through and resources and all of that stuff. I get to baggage claim and I'm waiting for my luggage and my phone rings and it's my daughter. And my daughter says, mom, you know, grandma's kind of taking a turn. I thought you might want to say goodbye. And I said, okay, put the phone up to her ear. And she said, brilliantly, she said, how about we FaceTime? I never thought of being able to do that. And so here I am in baggage claim, looking at my mom, you know, who's really pretty much comatose, telling her how much I love her and, and things. And I hang up the phone and next to me, a woman hands me a Kleenex. And she said, I don't know if you know this, but I sat across the aisle from you on the plane and my mom had dementia. And my gosh, I wish I would have known you at that time because I learned so much and I got so much comfort eavesdropping on your conversation. <laughs> you know, then I get to the hotel, I get another call. We end up doing a visual, 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 I can't say visual with my mom for like six hours through video conferencing. And, you know, I didn't think that that was possible. And so I have an older brother who was kind of getting out of line and he was irritating everybody. And he was saying some things that were just uncomfortable about, about mom dying and stuff. And from a distance over video, I could put him in place and the room cracked up with laughter. The tension was broke, you know, and things moved on. So people can always participate in this, but this, this, the main story that I really wanted to tell was when I went to my keynote the next day, I called and I talked with my mom and I said, um, mom, it's time for me to do my keynote. And we always agreed we were in this together. So I expect you to be there. And, you know, everyone in the room's like, are you crazy? You know, mom's comatose. She's dying. You're telling her to show up. So I, I go on stage and I actually tripped going up the steps. I didn't fall, but I just kind of tripped. And I looked up and the room was bright white lights. There were just orbs all over. It was blinding. And at that moment, I thought she's either past or she's present here. And I, I do my, my, um, my spiel for two hours. I get off the stage. I call to see how my mom's doing. And my daughter goes, mom, you're not going to believe this. She said, but when we hung up right before you went on stage, grandma's body got so hot and so red. And, and we did everything you said. We, we got big packages of washcloths and we were trying to cool her down. And, you know, we were doing everything you told us and we could not cool her body down. We didn't know what was going on. And she said, but what was really weird, she said about 10 minutes ago, she started cooling down. And I said, honey, that's when I got off the stage. So don't ever think that you are not connected because the power of our connections are so profoundly deep beyond what we can ever imagine if we open ourselves up to those connections. And, and again, I think with your, your book is really helping people not let go of those relationships and helping them build into adapting to a new world and, um, and a new lifestyle. And, and I think everything that we learn with dementia is applicable in all of our lives. You know, it can help us have deeper, better relationships with everyone. So I, I can't thank you guys enough for the work uh, that you did to pull this book together. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Just, just amazing. Um, in wrapping up, um, I just want to ask each of you, if you could tell our audience one thing that you think is important for them to take away with the book, what would that be? And um, Renee, I'm going to go to you first and then to Guy. The one thing is that 
a diagnosis of dementia is not the end. Mm -hmm. It's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, we can care for our loved ones. Dementia is not a clinical condition. It's an everyday condition. It's something that we live with. Mm -hmm. And we can live really well with it and still have the person who we love with us and maintain that connection that you described so beautifully. And by being aware, the message of this book is that we do have tools to make that last uncertain journey a beautiful one oh, for all of us. That's beautiful. And it really is a, dementia is a, to me, it's a diagnosis of society. It's, it's not one it, it's not just a family. There's just this massive ripple effect on, on everyone. Um, just like each of us, you know, has our power of one and how are we going to use that? You know, how are we going to show up in life? And, you know, life is all about adapting. This is just another chapter uh, in our life story in terms of how are we going to deal with this adversity that, you know, came on our doorstep. So thank you, Renee. Um, Guy, how about you? What would you tell people? Well, I don't think we touched on this, but we go into this quite greatly, especially in the opening section of the book. And that's about the importance of caring for yourself as a caregiver, as it is for the person that you're caring for. Because if something happens to you, there's no one to do that caring anymore. And so it, it is vitally important for the caregiver to eat well, do the exercises, etc., etc. But the, the point is, care for yourself as well as you do for the person you're looking after. I think that's a point that's critical that we try to push hard in the book. That's a really, really good point. And I think, you know, people know they hear about eating well and exercising but i don't think they that we talk enough about that emotional care to make sure our souls are filled with um with people who lift us up who who give us purpose in other areas of our lives because we're not none of us are just one thing you know we we have multiple roles in this world and finding that balance, I think is really important. And, and I know that because I didn't live that, <laughs> you know, I, I had a, another story on that whole thing, um, that I didn't realize how empty I got until I was filled back up. But I was, I was avoiding being filled back up because I was too busy being busy and caring. And boy, that was a really big mistake. But yet it was a it was a gift as a realization. And, and um, but yeah, it's one of those things that's really easily overlooked. So excellent, excellent um, point. Yeah, and of course, uh, I, I, I in, intended to include the emotional aspect. We go into great depth about the emotional aspect for the caregiver because it's truly important. Excellent, excellent. Again, you can... Uh, go to their website, which is yourmedicalsource.com forward slash Alzheimer's. You can find them on Twitter as Beat Alzheimer's and on Facebook as Your Medical Source. And is your book available like on Amazon and, and things like that as well? Yes, it's on Amazon and in maybe uh, it'll take about six, eight weeks. It should be available in bookstores and libraries throughout the okay. country. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Any Anything that we missed before we, we say goodbye to everyone? just want to say thank, thank you so much for all of your work and um, getting out the information, the resources, and we are just honored to be um, on your show. Well, yeah. thank you. And to I echo our that. Oh, thank you. And to our audience, I would just um, ask, like I do every show, be a giver of hope. Like, click, and share. We don't, we don't look at the numbers. That's not important to us. What's important to us is getting good information out to people who need it. And the easiest way to do that is through you. You have the power to help someone else, to help yourself, to get people educated 
hopefully before they need this information um, because people don't know where to look. And so the more information that we can share, the more comfortable the conversation and the faster people will feel confident and comfortable in, in tapping into those resources. So know that you make a really big difference and that you are appreciated. Thanks everyone. Bye now. Attention seniors, are you looking for a community that offers incredible benefits and stands up for your values? Look no further than AMAC. With an AMAC membership, you'll enjoy exclusive discounts on insurance, travel, dining, and shopping. Stay informed with six issues a year of our award-winning AMAC magazine, delivering trusted news and valuable insights. But that's not all. AMAC is committed to defending America's future by directly bringing the voices of our more than 2 million members to our elected officials. Join a community that cares about your needs and your values. For a limited time, we're offering a one-year membership for only $1. Yes, just $1 for a year of incredible benefits and advocacy. Don't wait. Take advantage of this special offer and join AMAC today. Visit amac.us slash join now. That's amac.us slash join now.